Good morning. Happy Monday. I hope you're on a great break. Uh, it's cool to see you all again. Today, 110, class presentations. Woo and that'll be the only thing we do. Problem set six, quiz six will be the following week, next week, Monday. So this Monday, what you'll do, you'll uh, give your presentation to the class. You'll turn in the final paper to me. And you'll also turn in the calorimetry lab that we did a couple weeks ago. Uh, should be fun, no lab afterwards, so when everybody's done, we're out of there. It probably won't go until five, I can never tell for sure, but it should be pretty cool. Uh, make sure that you have uh, like a USB drive that you can plug in and out if you have a presentation, or if you have access to your presentation on Google Slides, Microsoft, whatever, that's cool too. Just make sure you've got your username, password ready to go. Um, I will not, if you email me your presentation, I will not open up my email for you. <laughs> so this is something you gotta do. So again, if, you, if you're gonna use Google Slides or anything like that, just make sure you've got your stuff ready to go. Uh, again, the USB drive is awesome. Um, there'll be a little thing up here you could pull again, should be good to go. I cannot guarantee that your computer or tablet will connect. That's something you have to do too. That if you have a little cord that connects to, I think it's a VGA, uh, that might be a possibility. But again, it's much safer to have a USB drive or a uh, Google Slides, Microsoft Office presentation, stuff like that. Questions on that kind of stuff? For what it's worth, I'm really looking forward to your presentations. I've been teased by several of the things coming up, including some really cool uh, visuals, I think. So anyway, I think today is going to be cool, and I'm looking forward to it. All right. <clears throat> A week ago, seems like forever, we're talking about the orbitals. Now, uh, in the old days, <laughs> beginning of 20th century, they thought that electrons around the nucleus was kind of like planets around the sun, all right? But the problem with that theory is that planets around the sun use gravity. And gravity, uh, you don't have any positive negative interactions, which you do with negative electrons and positive protons. So if you have planets around the sun, i.e. electrons around the nucleus, there begins to build up some charge, and that will destroy the atom. Electrons either go flying off, or once in a while they'll go into the nucleus itself. So the electrostatic force is just different than gravity. So they came up with quantum chemistry, wave mechanics, whatever, there's different names for it, all right? And all of those revolve around four quantum numbers. Now, these came from doing Math 254 kind of calculus stuff on wave functions. And if you take 254, you can do this kind of stuff too. Uh, we're not going to do it here. That's beyond what we need. So we're using the results of this quantum chemistry stuff, which is just wild. And the results of the quantum chemistry came down to the four quantum numbers. They get symbols N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. Now, M sub S we're gonna talk about in the next section, but N, L, and M sub L are what we're talking about here. And N is the shell number, and the shell always starts at one, and it can go in whole numbers up to infinity. But you'll never see a shell uh, equal to zero, negative, one and a half, things like that. L is called the angular quantum number. It always starts at zero, and it goes up to n minus one. So L will never be greater than n, all right? It'll always be up to n minus one. M sub L depends on L, like L depends on n. On n. M sub L goes from minus L to plus L in whole numbers, including zero. And zero for M sub L and L are actually meaningful numbers. There's a meaning. If you see a zero for M sub L, it doesn't mean, oh, there's no M sub L values. That's actually a valid number in this weird system that's got set up. Um, M sub S is only positive or negative one half. And again, we'll talk about that more in the next section, but I wanted to throw it up here because it is one of the quantum numbers. Um, when you see things like 3P or 2S, that's what they call the NL notation. And L is literally the shell number. So for 3P, N would be three, because that's the number inside. And L gets a little letter associated with it. And the most important ones are SPDF. Those correspond to zero, one, 
two, and three. So for a three p orbital, you would have n equals three, because that's the big number in front, and p always means that l equals one. Question so far? Okay, so a week ago, we started looking at s orbitals, which are the first ones, and the s orbitals are basically just big spheres. P orbitals are basically figure eights like that. So you can see with a little bit of imagination, this looks like a figure eight. <clears throat> now, um, one thing to think about here is that there are nodes in uh, these crazy orbitals. And there are two types of nodes. And a node is a place where there's no electron density. Electrons here are behaving more like waves. They're not particles, which is just, still blows my mind when I think about it. But when you have a wave, uh, waves go up and down. Where the wave goes through that middle point, that's a node. There's no wave there. All right. There's wave in the top part. There's wave in the bottom part. But every time the wave is on the line, then there's, there's no wave. So a node is a normal part of a wave. Um, <clears throat> a planar node is just a, like a big sheet of glass that goes through the orbital. And there's no electron density in there. And all of these figure eight kind of things, they have like a planar node right in the middle. All right, let's see if slices right through. But there's also what they call spherical nodes. Spherical nodes are like beach balls within these electrons. And on the beach ball itself, there's no electron density. Um, it's easy to calculate both spherical nodes and planar nodes. Uh, planar nodes, doesn't say it here, but planar nodes, equals L. The number of planar nodes equals L. So you can see we're at a P orbital here. P is one. That means all of these planar nodes are going to have one planar node for the P system. And the number of spherical nodes, which is listed there, N minus L minus one. So 3P, N equals three. P equal, means L equals one. So it's like three minus one minus one, one spherical node. And if you look here, there's like a kind of a circle right there. And that is the spherical node inside these crazy things. And why they're important to count this is that if you have two atoms coming together and the other atom wants to bond right on one of those nodes, spherical or planar, ain't gonna happen. There's no glue to make the electron stick, all right? So the planar nodes and spherical nodes can be helpful to describe why some molecules come together as they are, and they don't have different configurations. And then the last thing is that n tells you how big, a relative sense, how big the orbitals are. So n equals three, like three px, will be bigger than n equals two, two px. Likewise, a 4px would be bigger than 3x. A 4s would be bigger than 3s, etc. And Prof Adolf, if nothing else, just realize that it's these weird rules we're looking at, which are weird a little bit at first, they all come from calculus. So you're taking super complicated math, turning it into these weird things, and we can actually use them then to describe the energy of orbitals, which is pretty cool. Chemists are all about the energy. Questions on anything? Yes. So these kind of like these clouds where these electrons are residing, was it all derived from just math? Or did, did they observe any of this visually at all? Both, which is really cool. Yeah, so the math came first, all right, and these areas, these big globes or whatever, those are the probability of where the electron is more than 90% of the time. So like me lecturing right here, most of the time I'm right here, but once in a while I'm like, hey, what's going on, all right? So it's where the electron is most of the time in the 3px orbital, all right? Uh, the really cool thing though is that they do have now pictures of it that are showing it. And if you take a like a time lapse photograph, all right, you'll see the electron boop, 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 and they these <laughs> sound effects not necessary, all right. But anyway, then you'll start to see these things, which is just wow. So yeah. Good question. Other questions? All right. So this is a kind of question we might see. This one says how many total nodes 
are in a 4P orbital. And when I say total nodes, all right, remember there's planar nodes and there are spherical nodes. And to answer this question, you have to know what the N value and the L value are for a 4P. So what is the N value for a 4P orbital? Four, that's right, yeah, I know, good. All right, it, I'm hoping it's done, but I, it's a little weird and everybody's like, oh gosh, it's Monday after Thanksgiving, I'm still so full, whatever. Yeah, N is four. Literally, the number is the N. Okay, so that's easy. Now, P, you have to use this little table over here. Uh, stupid people drive freaking gas hogs if you want to go down all the way to H, but um, whatever kind of acronym you want to use. But um, P means L equals one, all right? So in the 4P, you have N equals four, that's the number, and P means that L equals one, okay? Well, the planar nodes are gonna equal L, and L is one, so there's one planar node, okay? Spherical nodes, we need N and L. So N we saw was four, L is one, and we subtract one. So four minus one minus one, means there's gonna be two spherical nodes. So in the 4P, you've got two spherical nodes, one planar node, total nodes would be two plus one or three, all right? So this question's cool because it forces you to think about what's N and what's L, think about what the letters mean, and then there's two types of nodes, and if you figure out what both of those are, good to go. Any questions? Okay. Now, the D part is the next subshell or angular quantum number. And on Monday of last week, we looked at when L is zero, which means it's an S system or S orbitals. We just saw L equals one, which are P. Um, L equals two is pretty common. All right, and if you have an L equals two subshell or angular number, we're gonna be talking about Ds a lot in this section. And so let's think about a situation where we would have D orbitals uh, in a piece. So if N equals three, all right, and remember N the shell number always starts at one, goes up in whole numbers in theory up to infinity. So N equals three is legit. The first question says, what are the values of L? Well, L always starts at zero and it goes in whole numbers up to N minus one. So if N is three, three minus one is two. So that means that L values here are gonna be zero, one, and two. You can have more than one L value for a given N. In this case, there are three L values for N equals three. On Monday, I talked a little bit how shell is kind of like a street and L is kind of like the number of houses. So what we're seeing here is that on the N equals three street, there are three houses, there are three allowed values of L. And that kind of helps me uh, think about this a little bit. So when L values are gonna be zero, one, and two, because L always goes up to N minus one. So three minus one means the maximum uh, L is gonna be two. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna break these houses, these L values down and see what they represent. So if L equals zero, the allowed M sub L values, minus L to plus L, well, for zero, that's pretty easy because minus zero to positive zero is just zero. So there's one allowed M sub L value. Remember when L equals zero, that's S. <clears throat> this is gonna be a three S subshell. Subshell is my fancy name for houses, okay? And my three S subshell has one room. I talked about how M sub L numbers are kind of like rooms. So S is kind of like a shack, all right? It's like a fishing shack or something, just one room, just the utilities and stuff like that. This particular subshell has one orbital to it. But there's more than one house on this street. 
So the next house, the next value of L would be L equals one. Now when L equals one, M sub L goes from minus L to positive L. So that would be minus one to positive one in whole numbers, and zero is a legit value when it comes to these kind of things, by the way. So there are three M sub L values. This is like a three room house. So this is a little fancier, all right? We got like a ranch style house, I guess. This is an example of the three P subshell, all right? Because when L equals one, that's when we use the P. The three P house has three rooms. In my chemistry world, the three P subshell has three orbitals, three allowed M sub L values. Any questions so far? Okay. The last house on the n equals 3 street is when l equals 2. Now, when l equals 2, m sub l, just like up here, goes from minus l to plus l. But now we've got minus 2 to plus 2. So minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2, five m sub l values. That means there are five orbitals in this house, in the th what I call the 3D house, the 3D subshell. So notice how the 3S house had just one room, the 3P house had three rooms, and the 3D house had five rooms. In my chemistry world, the 3S subshell has one orbital, the 3P subshell has three orbitals, and the 3D subshell has five orbitals. So this would be like a split level house, a lot more rooms in this house than the 3P house does. Questions? Okay, so S orbitals don't have any planar nodes, and so they're spherical. P orbitals uh, have one planar node because planar nodes equal L. They look like a figure eight, sometimes they're called a dumbbell, either way is fine. When you get to the D rooms, the D houses, each of the orbitals, it's kind of like two figure eights, all right? If you use your imagination, there's like one figure eight that way and one figure eight at 90 degrees that way. And most of the D orbitals look that way. And like David was asking about earlier, these pictures uh, come from the math, all right? They represent the probability of where the electron is more than 90% of the time. Um, because L equals two with the D orbitals, that means there's now two planar nodes. And planar nodes are kind of like sheets of glass, and they're kind of like this. They're kind of like at 90 degrees roughly from each other. And most of these D orbitals look like this. I'll show you better pictures here in a little bit. So again, planar nodes equals L, spherical nodes N minus L minus one. This is like a, a 3D orbital, all right? Here's one figure eight, and there's a second figure eight. But there's literally like these sheets of glass that go through it. And again, that's no bonding in those areas. There's no electrons and stuff to hang out there. So you have to have just the right uh, configuration of electrons to make sense of the different bonding that's possible. Um, this picture up here, here, and here shows a planar node for a p orbital. And again, when you have a planar node, uh, it means it's kind of like a sheet of glass. So it kind of bisects this figure eight, this dumbbell, whatever you want to call it, and makes a nice line on it. But when you get to the Ds, the 3Ds especially, now you have two planar nodes. So two sheets of glass are going through it. And again, there's no way that in, with this kind of orbital, you could have some atom come in along this X axis right here and make a bond because there's no glue. There's no glue to hold those two atoms together. And that can be really important when it comes to making sense of what you see. Okay, so here's some more pictures with some videos. This is a 3D XY video. Don't worry about XY, XZ, these kind of things, all right? Including that for the P's as well. But there is a reason why. It's, it, they're all aligned along some kind of coordinate axis. But what I want you to see uh, is that, first of all, they do look, again, like two figure eights, all right? And they certainly have planar nodes. So one of the planar nodes is like right there. One of the planar nodes is right there. 
And again, you can't have any kind of electron density inside them. 3D, again, means that N equals 3, because that's the big number in front. And D, if you go back to the little chart, D means L equals 2. So this is N equals 3, L equals 2. These little lines right here represent the five rooms or orbitals in the subshell. This is the one we're looking at right now. You don't need to worry about that. The 3D XZ looks really similar. The difference is, is the uh, different kinds of uh, orientations you've got. So if you have some kind of X, Y, and Z axis, and you have to set this up mathematically, the other one was along the X and Y, I think, and this one's along the X and the Z. So this is fun with math. <laughs> we don't need to worry about it. Woohoo! heavens anyway because uh, it can get kind of crazy and anyway but again you can see there's two planar nodes this is the probability of where the electron is it's not right next to the nucleus it's not out this far most of the time most of the time in one of these kind of figure eight kind of things the YZ is similar again notice how the axes just change so instead of XZ XY now we have YZ so if you've done any of this kind of stuff in Math 254 or a class like that, you know um, it can be done, but uh, uh, I'm in, I've been in therapy for a while. I've gotten through my problems with that, but no, just joking. Should make jokes about that. Now, there is the one weird orbital here. It's called the 3D Z squared. It looks like there's a donut in the middle of it, and that's, again, a factor of math. Um, it does have planar nodes. They're harder to see, but if you see this weird donut, it's just one of the things that pops out of the math and stuff. It's the 3D Z squared orbital, and again, all this has to do with how you apply the math to the different things. This is the 3D X squared minus Y squared. This one's actually right along the Y and the X axis. So while the other ones were kind of between, this one's right in there. You don't need to know this, all right? I'm just kind of showing pictures here. Think of, think of them as family pictures for chemistry, I guess. <laughs> anyway. So at this point, I'd like to go through an example where we actually figure out all the different values for N equals 3, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to start with n equals 3, the n equals 3 shell. And we're going to figure out how many L values there are. We're going to figure out the letter that goes along with those L values. We'll figure out the NL notation. Then we'll go through the number of M sub L values and the number of orbitals. And if you follow along with this example, it's a really cool way to see that you've got these kind of rules down. So n equals three, like I said, is like a street, okay? And the street can have multiple houses on it, which are represented by L. And each L value will have certain M sub L values, which you can think of as rooms in the house. So we're gonna look here from n equals three about how many, how many rooms, how many houses there are, how many rooms there are. And again, I'm just gonna use these rules right here to figure it out. So, L values always start at zero and go up to N minus one. So if N is three, three minus one means the maximum L is gonna be two. So you would say that L values are zero, one, and two. There will usually be multiple L values for most N values. And in this case, it's zero, one, and two. If you had N equals four shell, you would have zero, one, two, and three. It always goes up to n minus one. And if you had an n of 15, the maximum L would be 14. It's always one less than whatever your n value is. Questions on that? Okay, now subshells, that's where this thing comes in, the letters, all right? And the reason they do that is if you had a three next to a zero or a three next to a one, it might look like a 30 or a 31. And 30 and 31 could be an N value. So scientists then quickly adopted these letters that will hopefully make it easier for you to tell what the N and the L values are. But this part's pretty easy. Zero, we saw, was an S. L1 is a P, and L2 is a D. So you would have S, P, and D subshells here. <clears throat> Those are like three types of house, if you will, all right? 
three types of house that can go through. If you had n equals 4, you'd have l equals 3 over here. That's when you'd have an f part right there. So nl notation is literally going to be this number with the letters that are right there. So the nl version of these uh, would be 3s, 3p, and 3d. These are what uh, we would call the subshells in the n equals 3 shell. So in my world, the n equals 3 shell has three subshells, the 3s, 3p, and 3d. In the real world analogy, the n equals 3 street has three houses on it. And we'll call the houses 3s, 3p, and 3d, because we're not being very creative, I guess. Questions so far? Now, M sub L depends on L. So to get these numbers right here, you go back to the L value. L goes from my, excuse me, M sub L goes from minus L to plus L. So when L is zero, that's just zero, because minus zero to positive zero is only zero, one allowed M sub L value. This doesn't mean there aren't any M sub L values. That's a legit M sub L value, which is a little bit funky, I know. So there would be one allowed M sub L value when L equals zero. Now when L equals one, M sub L minus L to positive L in full numbers. So minus one zero plus one would be the M sub L values here. When L equals two, it goes minus two to positive two in whole numbers minus 2 minus 1 0 plus 1 plus 2. In the real world analogy I've been using, we would say that the 3s house has one room, all right? We'll call them orbitals here a little bit. And the 3p house has three rooms because there's three m sub l values. Each allowed m sub l is a room. And the 3d house would have five rooms. Of course, in my chemistry world, I have to call them orbitals because that's how I roll, I guess. Um, there's one allowed m sub l value, so one orbital. Three allowed m sub l values, three orbitals. Five allowed m sub l values, five orbitals. And again, zero counts here as an orbital, all right? Normally zero we would ignore, but of course in this case that's something. Yes, but. Uh, when you say what's negative and positive, so zero there so you need to always put the zero in that's right it feels like you know you wouldn't have anything if there was zero but in this world zero counts <laughs> good so i'm glad you asked but absolutely okay some people love having formulas to figure these things out and that's fine too and man quantum has a ton of them but if you want to know the total number of orbitals for an n value n squared is how you'd figure that out. So notice that 1 plus 3 plus 5 is 9. Well, 3 squared is 9. So there's 9 total orbitals in the n equals 3 shell. We'll talk about this more later. But um, there are different kind of ways to figure these things out if that's how you like to roll. But if you can see this pattern, you can do it. And it's not bad once you get to it. It's just it's a little weird. Right. And like Gwendolyn brought up, a zero value is something that counts, which feels totally bizarre. Questions? Sometimes you'll see what we just did listed like a train track. And this is another way to think about it, which is totally cool. So this is the train track method for n equals 3. And some people like this, some don't. Um, n equals 3 means that uh, L is going to be uh, 0, 1, and 2. All right, there's three possible L values. Um, <clears throat> when n equals uh, 1, for example, then L equals 0. When n equals 2, you'd have 0 and 1. And what we did just a little bit ago was this part over here. When n equals 3, L can be 0, 1, and 2. So three rooms on the n equals 3 street, two rooms on the n equals 2 street, and one room, uh, one house, excuse me, on the n equals 1 street. 
And the number of rooms is these parts down here. These are the orbitals, the M sub L, magnetic quantum numbers, whatever you want to call them. Um, and it does depend on L. So when L equals 2, minus 2 to positive 2, there's like five possibilities. But when L equals 1, like here, negative 1, 0, plus 1, there's 3. Just like over here, when L equals 1, minus 1, 0, plus 1. And every time you have a 0, there's only one orbital, so one room house on that particular version. So. Now, uh, on the periodic table, S, P, and D are really pop, really common. But there's also F orbitals on the periodic table. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later. So we need to do, go one more step and talk about when you have an F orbital. Now, F orbitals are only possible when L equals 3. And you can only get to L equals 3 if N equals 4. So we're doing one more street. <laughs> All right, the N equals 4 street. Now, if n equals 4, l goes from 0 up to n minus 1, 4 minus 1, 3. So there's 0, 1, 2, and 3 for the l values, 4 houses, 4 subshells on the n equals 4 street or the n equals 4 shell. And like before, we looked at l equals 0, m sub l and m sub l equals 0. So the 4s, which is what L equals 0 would be, would be a one-room shack, one-room house. And like before, when L equals 1, M sub L minus L to positive L minus 1, 0, plus 1, three orbitals in the 4p subshell. Also, like we just saw with the d's, when L equals 2, m sub L minus 2 minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2, minus 2 to positive 2. Five allowed values, including 0, like Gwendolyn just asked about. So that's five orbitals on the 4d subshell. But the new player that does have a meaning on the periodic table is when you get to L equals 3. Now, when L equals 3, minus 3 to positive 3, you end up with 7 allowed M sub L values. So when you get to this, there are 7 orbitals. L equals 3 means F. So 4F subshell has 7 orbitals. The 4F house is the fanciest house we've seen. It has 7 rooms in it. Woo it's like a mansion. I don't know. Something that starts with F, but not the F word you might be thinking of. But anyway, whatever 4F you want to do, 4F is the biggest one. There's the most rooms in this one. All right, we'll see why that affects the periodic table. Yes. Um, does the number of orbitals always go up by 2? Because it kind of seems like it does so far. It goes up from 1, 3, 5, and then 7 for, yeah. the, for the F shot. So you don't really could just remember those numbers. It does. That's a totally fine way to do it. Um, if you have N, then the number of orbitals, as we saw, equals n squared. So at the end of that one slide, we added up 1, 3, and 5 to get 9 when n equals 3. But if, David, you have L, the number of orbitals equals 2 times L plus 1. So, for example, here we have L equals 3, and you don't want to count the numbers. Okay, 2 times 3, 6 plus 1, 7 orbitals. You bet. And L equals 2, 2 times 2 plus 1 would be 5 orbitals. And these are also really cool ways to see it. But you're seeing that, yeah, if you had uh, the next one would be G, all right, it would have 7 plus 2, 9 orbitals to it. You bet. Lots and lots of patterns in, uh, in this kind of stuff, which is both cool and frustrating at the same time. So, excellent observation. Other questions? Okay. Um, we won't spend as much time with the F orbitals as we will with the other ones, but I think it's important to show home pictures of what these look like. Now, we saw that the P's were like one figure eight, and we saw that most of the D's were like two figure eights, like at 90 degrees. Most of the Fs are essentially three figure eights. Now they're using alternating colors here for different math reasons, but there's like one figure eight, two figure eight, three figure eights. Some of them have donuts, like we talked about, the one weird one, but this one, there's like 
bunch of, anyway, I will not expect you to know or talk about these, but again, it's all derived from math. So you've got some kind of coordinate system down. Here's the X, Y, Z. So it's got things along those different axes and stuff. Um, it's kind of important to show, this did not come from our textbook. I had to find this from a website, but it is kind of cool to know that that's where the electron is on these crazy things more than 90% of the time. So these are the rooms of the F house, all right? These are the rooms where the electrons are gonna be in. And if you're talking today about an element that's a lanthanide or higher, and again, lanthanides start here at 57. So if your element is number 57 or higher, then your element has probably some of these filled up, which is kind of crazy and stuff to think about. So, so this is kind of an ooh and ah, but don't you know spend a lot of time thinking. Okay, so uh, chapter six, part one. Here's kind of a summary of the things that we've looked at, and uh, they're kind of uh, important to think about. First of all, we started with two really important constants, the speed of light and Planck's constant. The speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And you've got to know slash memorize slash put these on your cheat sheet. Uh, these are going to be important things to know. You can't keep looking them up all the time. Now we talked about, for example, the Ryberg equation, the big R. Don't worry about that. The Ryberg kind of gets washed up when it comes to the quantum mechanics. Um, C and H are super important because frequency, wavelength, these kind of things are all related by energy. And so we saw how energy equals H times nu, where nu is the frequency. And also, because the frequency equals the speed of light divided by the wavelength, lambda, energy also equals HC divided by the wavelength. This is another super important thing. All the light coming down on us right now, as well as the ultraviolet, if there's any out there from the sun or uh, stuff like or radio waves, all these things have this kind of phenomena associated with them. Wavelength is a distance between where the wave starts and stops. Frequency, you can think about it as the number of waves that go by per second, all right? A lot of times, wavelength is listed in nanometers, so you've got to know nanometers to meters. And finally, there are a thousand joules in a kilojoule. So if you see some kind of joule to kilojoule thing, that's another thing that's pretty important. Questions? Okay. Now, <clears throat> this equation is a different kind of wavelength than what we have right here. This equation is called the de Broglie wave equation. Its wavelength equals H over MV, where M is a mass in kilograms, by the way, and V is a speed or velocity of the object. Now, why they're different, these represent electromagnetic radiation. X-rays, radio waves, gamma rays, visible light, all of those follow these things right here but they involve what's called a photon, like small pieces of light, but there's no mass associated with them. This one here is the wavelength of a particle. And this was de Broglie's great contribution to this because he could show that certain particles have a measurable wavelength. And again, that makes no sense to us in our day-to-day -day world because you looking at me and me looking at you, I don't see anybody like, you know, <laughs> you know, too much caffeine, too much whatever substance you're drinking or whatever. But uh, seriously, I don't see any of that in any of you, and you should, hopefully don't see it in me either, although it was a long week. But anyways, so I'll prop that back on. This shows that electrons especially, right, they can have waves. So the wave-particle duality is a fancy name for why electrons behave as waves and sometimes why waves behave as particles. And this was Einstein's thing, the photoelectric effect. He showed that certain types of light behave like particles, blowing everybody's mind. De Broglie showed particles can behave as waves. Mind blown again, sound effects not necessary. So that's why both of these are important, but the wavelengths are different. This wavelength involves a particle with some kind of mass. Uh, supposedly particles can't go the speed of light, so that's why they shifted out C to a V but they are different phenomena, all right?
right? But they show that electrons can be like waves and the electromagnetic radiation coming down on us can actually behave as a particle. Questions on that? Okay, then you throw all the quantum mechanics stuff, which again is just math 254 when it comes right down to it, being applied to these behaviors for waves. So like you've all probably seen like, like sine waves and cosine waves and math and they, you know, graph them out. All right, well, these are just fancy versions of that. Um, very fancy, let's be honest. But anyway, they, uh, they do math on it. They get cool things out of it. I know that's not a very good explanation. But anyway, you get out from that then NL M sub L, which is listed over here. And as we'll see in the next chapter, M sub S. So the quantum numbers came from all the quantum stuff that was done. Now, shell is the most important one. It's like the street of the house. L is the angular or subshell number that represents the number of houses on the street. And M sub L represents how many orbitals you have in a particular area. So you can quickly find, like I was talking with David, the number of orbitals is n squared. So we went through the example of n equals three, and we took one plus three plus five and found it was nine, which was three squared. That's a way to find quickly the number of orbitals if you know the L value. Now, David asked about the plus two on each orbitals on each shell, which was totally cool too, and he's correct. If you know an L value, then 2L plus 1 is the number of orbitals. So when you have the L equals 0, the S ones, 2 times 0 plus 1, only one orbital. But when you go to L equals 1, 2 times 1 plus 1, 3 orbitals. 5 on D, 7, 9, 11, etc., etc. Patterns are everywhere in quantum chemistry. Some people use them all the time. Some people just think about it another way, which is fine, whatever works for you. All these four Ds, three Ss, five Ps, whatever, it's NL notation. And the number that goes in front is the N value. Those are easy to find. But the L value, we have to use something else because if you had, a, say, a 5S, it would be like a 5, 0, and you would know if that was S or N or whatever. So the letter just tells you what the L value is going to be. So 4D means N equals 4. That's the number. And D means L equals 2. And then finally, eventually, maybe not even in this class, but in some classes, that nodes become really important because if you want two atoms to come together, they won't bond if you're at a node. So the planar nodes are like sheets of glass that go through an orbital where there's no electron density. The number of planar nodes just equals L. These are the L values right here. No planar nodes at L equals zero S, but you start having one at L equals one P's, two at D's, et cetera, et cetera. Spherical nodes are also important. It's N minus L minus one. So if you had four D, N would be four. D means L equals two. Four minus two minus one, there would be, uh, there would be, uh, Two minus, four minus two, I forgot what I was saying. Sorry, I had a long weekend, I guess. N equals four, L equals two, four minus two minus one, you'd have one spherical. Sorry, not my most elegant moment. Anyway, if you can knock these out, all right, you've got the fundamentals of this quantum stuff, all right? And it's, it's a little weird, I won't lie. Uh, if nothing else, I hope you can appreciate how, whoa, they took this crazy math and they distilled it down to these four quantum numbers. And the patterns work really well, as we're going to see, for figuring out electron energies uh, around atoms, which is what scientists are after most of the time. Questions? Yeah, Jeff? Okay. I wanted to show you one example of where the nodes become important. Zeiss's salt is a compound made from platinum chloride and ethylene. The ethylene cannot bond to the platinum unless orbitals in the two fragments are oriented properly to each other. This alignment occurs most effectively when the ethylene is perpendicular to the molecular plane of the platinum chloride fragment. This is a platinum center with some chlorines around it. This compound has a carbon-carbon double bond. You don't even need to worry about that. 
But what is really cool here is that you would think that you could make this molecule, like right now, it's kind of going into the board and out of the board atoms. But it makes sense that you could maybe twist it 90 degrees and the carbon atoms would be close to the chlorine and this would, the other carbon would be close to the chlorine. But you don't see it, all right? And that's because of the way the orbitals set out. In this version of the orbitals, there's kind of like a two figure eights on the platinum. It's one of the D orbitals. And that orbital is trying to bond with two P orbitals, which are what's happening right here. And you have to have the orbitals come together. That's the glue that holds these atoms together. And if you did it 90 degrees, then this one would be up here, and the platinums would be at 90 degrees. No interaction, no glue. So you only see this particular bonding when it comes to this molecule. Uh, we'll see some examples of this uh, in Chem 222, but I just wanted to kind of show you an example of how cool this stuff can be. You can throw tomatoes if you want to. Yeah, Gabriel. So how would you rotate the uh, It doesn't happen, period, as far as anybody knows. Yeah. Uh, if you want the three chlorines right there, and you want the carbons to be up and down, I don't think anybody's made it, man. And it just has to do with the orbitals. And that's, that's why we're studying all this, all right, to try to figure out like how these things come together. And we're certainly not at the point of making the orbitals start talking to each other, but that's where people can go, all right? And uh, in this case, don't spend a lot of money trying to make the version where they're 90 degrees, because I don't think it's possible, so, good. Yeah, just to clarify, um, so the two atoms will only bond if the orbitals are like parallel to each other rather than perpendicular 90 degrees to each other. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's like if I said, oh, Gina, I haven't seen you in a long time. And Gina, you don't have to do it, but she puts her hands on like this. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Well, if I come in like this, she just going, like, weirdo. <laughs> I'm weird anyway. That's exactly the point. But yeah, I, I, you have to make a connection. All right. Hands to hands are like orbitals to orbitals. All right. It's the glue that holds thing together. And yeah, so if Gina puts her hands straight out and I come in like that, that's weird. That's not going to happen. But if I do this kind of thing, then we'd have good connections. Thank you for being my boss. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> I should do it to the mirror in the back because she always is quiet back there. Anyway, uh, prop that back on. <laughs> questions? <laughs> All right. So chapter six, part one, is kind of a mind-blowing thing. And a lot of people haven't seen some of this stuff uh, in other chemistry classes. And trust me, that's totally normal. Um, these quantum numbers, again, are easier than the math but they're still kind of weird, right? So what I'm going to do now is talk about chapter six, part two. And believe it or not, I think the things will kind of come a little bit more into clarity as to why we're doing all the things we did. In this chapter, we're gonna see why the periodic table is as it is. Like why are there only two elements in the first uh, period? And why are the main group elements like here? And why are the transition metals right here? Stuff like that. And why are the lanthanides and actinides down here? All right. So all of these things will become a little more clear now uh, based on these quantum numbers. So there's a reason for the madness. Uh, hang on and we'll try and show you what's going on. Also, finally, I'll show you why I'm hoping one day, tomorrow, 10 years from now, who knows, there will be a third line of elements down here. It'll be separate from these two. It'll be a little bit longer, all right? But uh, I, we're so close to it, and I'm just hoping that it's going to Hey, I need to get out more, I know. So we saw in the last section how there's shells, subshells, and orbitals, and I talked about how shells are like streets, and subshells are like the houses on the streets, and orbitals represent the number of rooms in the houses on the streets. So n equals three had three subshells, zero, one, and two. The zero had one orbital, the one had three orbitals, the L equals two had five orbitals, n squared was the number of orbitals if you want, stuff like that. But there's a fourth quantum number too, and it gets the symbol M sub S. And M sub S, as we'll see, is probably my favorite of the quantum numbers, if you have a favorite one. Anyway, the fourth quantum number is called the electron spin quantum number, or the spin quantum number. It's given the symbol M sub S. 
And M sub S at first was not something that they used when they did quantum mechanics. But what happened is this guy, Dirac, came in and he applied Einstein's relativity to quantum mechanics. <sighs> Sound effects not necessary, but mind blown once again. And believe it or not, M sub S came out naturally when this happened. So this was like an extension, you know, a, a DLC for quantum mechanics, <laughs> extra power, uh, more NPCs, whatever. Anyway, so Dirac uh, was pretty cool uh, in combining all these things together. Uh, this will be a good place to stop. We'll talk more about Dirac and the spin quantum number on Wednesday. Thanks for being here. Looking forward to your class presentation. Have a great day.